I want to start the lecture off with a question. And I'm asking this question in its most general sense. What is like the most essential goal of a coach? And I think the most essential goal of a coach or a teacher or anybody in that kind of position is to optimize learning. I think the best coaches stimulate as much learning as possible from the person that they're teaching or coaching per unit time. I think that's what we're all trying to do when we're teaching someone something like the starting strength method, how to squat, how to move. I think that's also, that goal is independent of, con of what is being learned. Any coach trying to teach anybody something, they're trying to make them learn. So if that's our goal, we have to distinguish, we have to define what learning is. And we, in order to do that, we need to distinguish it from this other thing called performance. So performance is what your trainee is doing right now in the moment. It's measured by a coach's eye against a model. This is a little different than learning which reflects relatively permanent changes in capability to perform a skill. Learning is measured with retention tests, okay? Retention tests are comparing a previous performance to a current performance. So can anyone in here, does any, with, with that kind of framework outline, does anyone have an idea, could you give me an example of a retention test in, in barbell training? Anybody, any ideas? So a retention test, an example would be like the video your trainee sends you of their work sets the following time they train, right? You're not there coaching them anymore in that moment, but they're showing you, they may have, they may have done a session with you and then they're sending you a video of their, of their work set the next time. They're showing you what they learned, what they retained from that previous instruction, right? Another example would be in, in, in uh, restricted to real time would be watching their uncoached warm up sets on the, ne the, the next time they're training. Like you're just watching, you're just seeing what they're learning, where they're screwing up. It's before you're necessarily intervening with some more instruction or feedback. Um, learning, it's important to note that learning is a product of active problem solving processes. We're gonna keep coming back to this idea of stimulating active problem solving in, in the context of queuing throughout, throughout the rest of the lecture. Um, the distinction between learning and performance is important because it describes a phenomena that all of us have experienced as coaches. We teach somebody something one day and everything looks really solid on the platform and then the next time that we coach them, they're doing the same exact thing wrong, right? We finished the session last time with a breakthrough or with some type of, they finally are getting their knees out. They know what that is, right? And then the very next time you coach them and it's just like the same exact thing happens. Like, what is going on there, right? What, what we can now say with this distinction is that this person's able to perform under, in, under instruction but they're not retaining, they're not learning, it's not a permanent change in their capability, okay? So, now we need to go to, we need to talk about how we think and use cues. How do we, how do we describe, how do we currently describe cues? What's our terminology to describe cues? Anybody? Not a trick question. Reminders. Cues are reminders. How, 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 how do we um, describe the type of reminder we're giving somebody? Exactly. We say things like verbal, tactile, visual. And this is good and it's important in the context, I think it's most important actually in describing what we did when we're talking between coaches, right? It's important in, it describes how 
we, it describes the sense data which we communicated through the lift, communicated our idea through the lifter, okay? And what I want to introduce to everybody is a slightly different way to, to describe and think about cues in the context of generating an active problem solving process in the trainee, okay? How to think about cues in the context of stimulating this active problem solving process is in where the trainee's attention is directed. Attention in a general sense is how our brain, um, it's the, the mechanism by which our brain comes, comes to terms with information. It's, it represents how we access our consciousness and it's a very limited resource. Attentional focus is what we're concentrating on in any given moment, all right? Attentional focus can be broken down into two main factors, all right? We're either going to have an internal focus of attention or an external focus of attention. An intern we're going to talk about internal a little bit first. Internal focuses the athlete on a body movement. An example would be chest up, knees out, right? If you're saying an anatomical part and then a movement, you're, using an in you're, you're, you're focusing the athlete internally on the body movement. This is our like default for how we cue. And I think that has to do something with how we learn the information we're trying to communicate. It's the language, this is the language of biomechanics, anatomy, exercise, physiology. It's how we have learned to think about what we're trying to communicate. Internal cueing is giving, when I, when I use an internal cue, I'm giving the solution to the problem when I'm, when, I'm, when, I'm t when I'm communicating to the athlete or the lifter. This is a good way to communicate when someone is first learning something, right? When, someone is f when, when you're going through this introductory phase, there's this, this way of communicating is, is clear and it, it can help people learn in this very, in the beginning phase of instruction. Whereas, and this, this is compared to an external focus, which focuses on the result of movement. Okay, we also use a ton of these. Um, an example here would be, point your nipples to the floor. Would be, press the bar to the dot on the ceiling when you're doing a bench press, right? These, the type, these cues, they're, they're fundamentally different and what they're doing is they're letting the persons figure out how to solve the problem. We're not telling them exactly how to move, right? What we're doing is we're telling them a problem that they have to, if, if, if they're going to conform to the model that's in our head, they have to move that way and solve it themselves, all right? This type of cueing has the best capacity to stimulate the most learning. It's, it's goal oriented, so you, so you always have like, you always are saying to do something, you're just not telling them how to do it. And they should be able to identify if they accomplish the goal or not, right? The first time, I didn't actually know that this is what I was thinking about, but I work with, I work with uh, Ina Koppel at Woodmere Fitness Club, and, um, half of the people that I work with are Orthodox Jewish women. And about three years ago, uh, three or four years ago, we added the point your nipples to the floor cue in the teaching, in the teaching progression to get people to lean over more, right? And I realized when I got back home to Long Island 
that I could not tell the Orthodox, use that cue when I'm talking to Orthodox Jewish women. Now, that was, that was going to be a no-go, right? So, when I was training men or, or people that were coming to me, I would, I, you know, from, from outside that, that community, I would use it. And then when I was training the Orthodox Jewish women, I would just say something different. Lean over more, like that was trying to communicate the same idea. Lean over more, bend forward at your hips, I don't know, something like that. And what I was realizing was, when I said point your nipples to the floor, right, people learned faster. They understood in a different way what I was trying to communicate to them versus when I said, lean over more. And I, and I didn't have some type of explanatory tool to explain my experience or if this was just some more general principle, principle idea that could explain lots of different experiences, right? And I realized when I was researching and kind of, I've talked to Rip about this before and thinking about and reflecting on my coaching experience and, and, and digging into some research, that this is a principle idea. This is that, that can be applied in lots of different contexts and lots of different ways, right? Whenever we use, so just a few more examples here about um, generating an external focus with somebody. Like whenever we're using an analogy or whenever we're using a implement, we're, us we're also using an external focus, okay, or, or, or an external cue. So this w an example of this would be like the Tebow, right? The person solves ha how to not knee slide by completing the task of not knocking over the piece of wood. We can tell them to unlock their knees first, or we can use a cue like that to try to try to fix it um, if if it's a, if it's like they're they're staying back too much and their knees are punching forward. But they learn how to actually s correctly set their knees in a more fundamental way when they're focused on interacting with their environment and they're not focused necessarily on the conscious override. Um, so now we kind of know the difference a little bit between internal and external focus cueing. It's now we need a way to describe why it's, why it's working. And this, this comes from Gabriel Wolf. Uh, this is, th so did the internal and external focus. She was the person who figured this out. And she came up with this constrained action hypothesis. And what she's saying is an internal focus produces a conscious type of control or a conscious override um, that causes the individual to constrain their motor system. And what you see when someone gets too focused internally is like uh, is a massive co-contraction and these micro choking episodes. We see this most with arm bend in the clean, right? This is just like when, when you're trying to cue somebody's arm bend out, they start thinking about their arms, they get so focused on whether they're keeping their arms straight, and you inevitably get reps where they bend their arms more, they're squeezing the bar as tight as possible, and they're like shrugging and they get caught up like before the rack position. Like the whole thing, they get so inside their arms, right, that the whole thing ends up going, going to crap, right? Um, also see it sometimes with the hip thrust and the press for people who really don't get it, right? They start thinking about so much about the hip thrust and the press that everything else gets tight in like the not good kind of way. It's just like they're the whole, they, you know, they, the whole thing starts to fall apart if they get too focused on this one area. That would, those are examples of micro choking or a, and the, the co-contractions coming from thinking internally. Um, where when you tell, when you use an external focused cue, what happens is the person's system naturally self-organizes in order to accomplish the goal or the task that you're giving them. So that, that's why you don't see the co-contraction, the micro-choking, and the, and the bypassing, and it, it, because it's, it's skipping that. It's skipping that kind of stuff. Um, 
So we'll just do a couple more practic practical examples here. I didn't want to fill this lecture with it because part of the spirit of it is with, I want everyone to take these ideas and work with them, especially with people who have been struggling to solve certain problems and come up with some of their own cues to fix it, right? You can, you can use, once you understand like where you're, once you understand that learning is a product of, of where someone is drawing their attention, you can start to manipulate that and um, you, 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 you can get creative in what you say to them in different ways. Like an example, the other day I was coaching somebody and the, and actually the, the point your nipples to the floor cue wasn't working. It was actually the first time I, I really, that really wasn't working. But she was wearing glasses. And so instead of making her bend over more or, you know, trying to do, like, getting in there, I just told her, when you squat, make it feel like your glasses are going to fall off your head. Boom. She, that was what, that's what, what clicked for her. But when I had this paradigm in my head, that's what I, what you can do is once something fails, you can think about how I can go about correcting it in a different way by drawing attention externally and seeing if they can just figure it out as an artifact of solving a problem. Here's the difference between, between internal focus and external focus is the difference between learning by instruction and learning by discovery. Both of these two things are still learning. When you give somebody, it's not, when you, when you focus somebody internally, it's not like they're not learning and continuing to get better and continuing to progress, right? It more has to do with the rate of learning and the capacity of learning from a, uh, from a single event. Like how permanent am I making the learning, right? So, I planned on having a, a, you know, a, some time for questions because I knew this was going to probably be a new topic or a new thing that no one's ever really, or we've, we've recognized as coaches, but we didn't have like a framework in, in how to think about it. Um, so, I have, this is the conclusion, but I want to take some time for questions. The gen is... It's not what your trainee is doing, but how they think about doing it that ultimately makes the difference in how much they learn. And what we as coaches are trying to do is not only influence what they're doing right now, right? Because how many people in here have clients and coach people that they only see like once a month, right? Or once, every, or once every two, a lot of people, right? A lot of people contact us off the website, they see us, they do a session for a month, and they do a session, and then a month or two later, they come back for the next session. And it's like, how do we prevent the deterioration of whatever we're teaching them in, on that kind of monthly basis? So when we coach them again, it's not like this huge surprise and a massive amount of form creep is set in. How do we start to control for that? And I think it's by, especially with these longer term problems and the things people are struggling with, giving them a problem that they can go back to and solve over and over again, almost as like an internal checklist, than to, um, you know, than to, than to just tell them what they're doing wrong. So one of, the, one of the things that I've also been doing to kind of amp this up, right, and uh, I have to attribute it to Carl. That's why he raised his hand. Um, when I'm using an external focus, or once I give somebody the goal, what you can do is ask, ask them in between repetitions, especially if the weight is light enough and they're in this learning phase, if they accomplish the goal or not. Right? So one of the things that I've been doing is I create this kind of, if, if the goal doesn't inherently have feedback built into it, you don't need to do this with something like a Tebow, right? This because they'll know instantly if they completed the goal or not because they knocked it over, right? But if they are too distracted by the weight on the bar to actu and they're not actually thinking about 
what you're trying to do for them, right, or what you're trying to instruct them to do, what I do is I ask them if they accomplish the goal or not. A good example of this is somebody who has um, bar sliding up their back on the way down to on, on the way up from the squat. They hip drive, the bar rolls up like a tiny bit. They're losing their like upper chest kind of. They're, they're losing back tightness as they're ascending in the squat. One of the things that I say is, when you start to hip drive or when you start to come up, I want you to feel like the bar rolls down a tiny bit on your back. Right? I don't actually want the bar to roll down, but I tell them, I want you to try to make it roll down. And that's what they're thinking about now, right? And what happens is, if the bar rolls down for mo most of the time, or they're thinking about making the bar roll down, they end up holding that position. I never even draw, there's not even like a thought of drawing their attention to, the, to their chest. They're thinking about, how do I make the bar roll down? And they end up just holding a much tighter upper back position in the bottom of the squat. But because this movement of the bar is so subtle, most of the time people don't even recognize that it's happening. So what I do is, I, is they're, they're gonna do a rep and they're gonna have no idea, after I give them a cue like that, they're gonna do a rep and they're, they're gonna have no idea what happened, right? So I asked, so I ask, did the bar roll down their back? And I force them to answer me. I, try, I use social pressure, right, in order to force their, to, to like increase the amount of cognitive load they're doing, like the, to increase their thinking about what they're doing. I'm like upping the ante, right? And they'll inevitably tell me the wrong answer. They'll say yes, because they just think they, I don't, know, I don't know why, but they just think they did. And I'll say no, you have to try again. It rolled up, right? Then I make them answer me again. Inevitably what happens through this back and forth, is they finally figure out, they ha they'll get an aha moment. And I think, it's, I think it's driven by the fact that I am, that they know that they have to answer me. They can't tell me that they don't know, right? So they go through, this is the whole theme, right? An active problem solving process to figure out what they're, what they're doing wrong feels like. And then you can, um, and then it, they end up figuring out how to fix it. I think in, in the literature that's called tran, uh, translational feedback, but uh, I haven't actually read that. My professor told me that, so that's, <laughs> that's what I'm going to go with. But um, that was just one technique that I've gotten out of that to kind of up the amp ante on the external focus. So we had a conversation, Carl and I had a conversation about some of these ideas in their immature form about six months ago or so. Um, and that's another, at least another person who's been implementing it that's finding it helpful. Um, I also wanted to, this is a little separate than this, but in general, if you have the stimulating active problem solving as like your foundational reasoning or base for trying to cue out the hard or more um, complex problems, in the context of online coaching, I have not tried this idea. I just started doing online coaching. I'm only coaching seven people. Um, but you can ask them. I know that's what they, th they think you're paying you for. But if you want to or frame it to stimulate learning, right, you can ask them what they see if they're sufficiently advanced and start to get them to reflect and think about what they're seeing in the squat. And then you can give them feedback on what they saw. So it's the whole idea of just stimulating an active problem solving process and kind of that's a way for once what, what we're trying to do is with, with both the Socratic coaching and that online technique is get the person to start self error detecting. That's really what you're trying to do. Because eventually with coaching, with teaching and all all that we're doing, it's like we're trying, I want to make squatting like riding a bike. I don't want to make squatting uh, like, like something that almost becomes exactly how you, something that you know intrinsically how to do eventually after practicing it enough. But you might, as an athlete, have trouble articulating exactly what you're doing. I wanted it embedded that deep. And the only way for me to embed it like that 
is to force people to solve their own problems after, you know, after they know kind of what they're doing already. And the re it's, it's, it's learning in, I don't like the, dis the way we describe learning, not we, just in general, learn how learning is described as through auditory, visual, or uh, kinesthetic kind of channels because it, it's that same athlete, and this is just my own observations, that same person, right, that learns from, um, that learns how to do a squat super well, right? If you put them in a classroom and they look at some type of model or abstract thing on the di like diagram visually, they might not be able to, they're not just like gonna memorize that per se. I think those types, I think we have like people that solve motor problems really well and people that don't solve motor problems really well. Um, and I think that especially when you use something like an implement. So here's an example, like someone's not getting their knees out, right? And they're having trouble understanding or doing what that is. You, with this type of cueing, you can use implements to set up the environment where they at least initially have to succeed. So someone like to, or someone's not getting their knees out again. If I put a foam roller, a half one, a, a 18 inch foam roller on the inside of their foot, right? And then I tell them, that I want them to squat without hitting the foam roller. They will figure out a way how to do that. They won't necessarily know that they're pushing their knees out per se, right? But the, what, what happens is you can create problems that people can solve below the level of their awareness. And I think a lot of times these kind of motor challenged people, what they have is just a super low level of awareness. and trying to solve it by making them more aware is, um, might be hard. Whereas if you just set up some type of environment like, like that, I'm just as an example with a foam roller or a T-bow or something like that, they almost have to do it. They almost have to do it right. Does that make sense? Um, I'm just gonna point out that uh, Nick, Nick's talking about doing this in an active way to solve especially persistent problems. Yeah. And I think it's great. I've actually talked to him about learning and memory stuff going back years because we have a shared interest. But if you'll think about it, there's a whole lot of this that's already incorporated in the teaching yeah, method that's and some of the basic cues we use. We just haven't been thinking about this way. Okay, so for example, the master cue is just a glaring example. When you're doing the press and you tell them to hit their nose, when you don't just say, push your knees out, you say, hit the, the walls on the opposite side. I mean, so you're, some of those exaggerated cues fall right into this path. What's important here, I think, in this talk, aside from giving you some of the, the background on how this works, right? Not just observing it works, but you know, he's talking about some terminology that can help you learn more about this kind of approach. But actively using it intentionally to expand your coaching tool set, that's really where this is super important. Okay, so he gave the example of bar going down the back. I mean, this gives you another way to approach something intentionally with very difficult clients who are not able to really get the movement. So if you start thinking about developing these things with your guys that you're working with, you, know, you all have those really frustrating people that you just are beating your head in. Okay, so he, this is great. Because now here's your special project to make you come up with 10 new ways to approach it that are going to help you with your easy clients, maybe. Um, so I would look at this as something that maybe is going to take an extra bunch of time using it in every place. Uh, I think you already are using this a lot of times with, with approaches and cues and teaching that we already do. But now, start trying to expand that. Like, well, you know, you've been using certain cues and they work and some are high percentage. This is, this is going to help you be more inventive as a coach and reach some of those hard cases and maybe think of better, better cues to use first over time. Oh, here's another point. When you use this type of cue, if performance decreases initially, that's okay. That's actually supposed to happen. What that is is the person wrestling with the problem that you just gave them to try to solve it. So to, to answer your question, 
I don't want to guard against possible errors because the error detection process that the person is going through, if and when they screw up, because a lot of people will, is what's causing the learning, right? I don't want to take away the, the error. I've done an error, right? The person who fell over now knows that bending over that much is too, is too much, right? So then they, I know with falling over, it's a little, uh, it's a little, you know, if you don't want someone to actually fall with a barbell on their back. But the point is, I don't want to build into these cues um, guards against possible errors because I want them to make the errors, recognize it's an error, and then try to correct it. 